Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be in South Africa. Your country is at a real pivotal point. I'm going to talk about expropriation without compensation in other countries. And some of the examples I'll give you may be a bit disturbing. They may seem a bit extreme, but there are two things they all share in common. Expropriation without compensation was a pivotal key point. That's number one. And number two, no one who implemented those policies anticipated or intended the final outcomes. So let me start then with some of the key lessons that we should pick up. It's been tried before. It often fails to meet its ostensible goals. Intentions and consequences are not the same, as Temba uh, emphasized. Those should be kept in mind. It doesn't matter, as with inflation or other policies, what the religion or color or ethnicity or origin of the people is. If you print lots of paper money, it will fall in value. It doesn't matter whether you're in China or Hungary or Argentina or Zimbabwe. It's the same. <clears throat> Humans respond to incentives. And the consequences of changing the incentives can be very, very severe. One should do so only with the greatest caution. So let me start with the first story, Kazakhstan. Uh, 1933 to, 1931 to 33. They uh, engaged in de kulakization This preceded what took place in Russia and Ukraine, which are much better known. But the Kazakh case was uh, quite hor horrifying. They expropriated the livestock from the nomadic Kazakh people uh, and brought in European colonists, literally millions of them. They opened Kazakhstan to European colonization. They began in 1929 expropriation of land and forced collectivization. They would force people to add their land, their livestock, and their assets to the collective farms. Well, what happened? Harvests simply collapsed. And furthermore, livestock. It turned out that when you tell a Kazakh nomad, we're going to take your animals, they kill them first to be able to salt the meat and eat them. And then there's nothing to confiscate. So the consequence was the numbers of sheep and goats declined by 70% and 90% in that two-year period. A total collapse of the livestock, which is what the nomadic peoples lived from. Millions of people fled. They went to China, they went to Turkey, they went to Iran and Afghanistan. The consequence was devastating. In a two-year period, roughly one-third of the Kazakh population perished and about one quarter of the total population or other ethnic groups in the Kazakh region uh, during that time. So about a million and a half people died in a two-year period. What's interesting about the Soviet statistics is Stalin told them to stop keeping statistics about people, but they kept very good statistics on livestock. That told you something about how the system worked. Now Ukraine is better known they started with collectivization of land, the kulaks, the wealthier part uh, peasants, they divided into three classes. The rich peasants, that was a peasant with a hut and a cow and some simple implements. Middle peasants and then poor peasants. And the kulaks were the enemies of the people, they were the exploiters, they often hired labor from the poor peasants, they had to be confiscated. The grain was requisitioned because, again, harvests collapsed. Who is responsible? They're hiding grain. So grain is what requisitioned. Uh, many people were deported. Uh, they were dumped just in barren fields in Siberia and Kazakhstan. Uh, activists were brought in from the cities. Uh, these might, you might imagine them coming in South Africa wearing red berets. Uh, these were urban people, and they were told, go and find the grain. Educate the farmers. Tell them they must not hide grain anymore. Indeed, they built watchtowers with young people, high school students, brought from the cities with binoculars to spy on the peasants. And anyone seen bending over to pick up grain, they'd call in the OGPU and have them taken off to labor camp or executed. And the consequence was uh, simply disastrous uh, for the people there. They call it the Holodomor, uh, 
which means the starvation death uh, in Ukraine. <clears throat> Between 1928 and 1932, again, the number of cattle and horses dropped by roughly half. They killed the horses and ate them also, rather than have them simply requisitioned uh, by the state. Uh, the pig population declined from 26 million to 2 million. Again, we have no really super accurate census data on people, but they did keep very good numbers on pigs. And sheep from 146 million to 50 million. The estimates are unclear, but it's believed about 4 million people died in a short period of time. Uh, 2 million in just the period between May and July of 1933, and the eyewitness accounts are absolutely horrifying and stomach-churning, including accounts of cannibalism and other things that people do when they are starving to death. Uh, here, these are pictures of people who just died on the street, and people would walk past because it was a common sight to see people stagger over and die uh, before you. Uh, the total death toll over the entire region, including Russia, between six and seven million uh, people who died in a short period of time. Romania is another interesting case. It was much more gradual, much less terrible, but nonetheless uh, quite instructive. The communists took over in 1948. The country was occupied by the Soviet army. And they began to nationalize first companies, firms, factories were taken over. Uh, by the party in the state. 1949 is when they turned their attention to the agricultural sector. And large land holdings of uh, peasants were confiscated. There's a very interesting distinction between nationalization of industries and nationalization of farms. They ended up, the stories are a bit different. In industries, they could haul off the owner and execute him or her or send them to labor camp. Uh, but there was still some system of production. There were managers and employees, and they could continue doing what they had been doing. They didn't innovate. They didn't change. They used the capital up, but it didn't stop production overnight. Agriculture was different. It turns out you have to plant the plants every year. Who knew? And if you don't do that, you won't get any more whereas machines will last some period of time. And I remember going into Slovakia, and the looms in the, in the industry actually predated World War I. They just kept using them. In East Germany, when the West Germans came in after reunification, they found the phone systems, and they were shocked. They said these would be in a museum. They still had the moving parts. Uh, this was in 1990. So those were telephone connections from before the Second World War. You could still, still keep doing that, but not with agriculture. It's different. So they confiscated the large holdings of the peasants, allegedly to redistribute to the poor ones. Production uh, collapsed again, and they went on to more solutions, which was state-managed farms. About 80,000 peasants were arrested and imprisoned. But the death toll was not nearly as high. It was a much longer period. Uh, the progress on collectivization was slow, but there was declining output in a largely formerly agricultural country. One of the consequences was pushing people out of agriculture into industry. So they became a modern industrialized country, if you will, but producing things that had little or no value. Uh, Michael Polanyi, the Hungarian uh, student of this, called it the system of conspicuous production. They produced massive amounts of concrete and steel in order to build factories to produce concrete and steel, and so on. So this was, again, why many people believe the Soviet Union had a larger, higher rate of economic growth up until its last year, because steel and concrete production were much higher than in Western Europe or the United States. But they were not producing for the market. Uh, nonetheless, a huge movement into agriculture and uh, to industry and agriculture began to collapse. The consequence in a formerly very wealthy agricultural uh, economy, 1981, very strict food rationing was reintroduced into the country. People were hungry. They said Romania was a hungry country. 
And this was shocking to older people who remembered the relative abundance of food. They also humiliated them. Again, who is responsible for the declining outputs? It's the farmers. The farmers have to be told how to farm. And so the Ceausescus, including Elena Ceausescu, had a third grade education, but was Dr. Ceausescu. And everyone had to sing songs to her and poems, and every academic book in the country had an uh, introduction praising her and so on. They forced the farmers into collective villages with communal kitchens. So if you could imagine the horror that this represents to people to have to be in a communal kitchen rather than having their own kitchen was a form of humiliation. The shortages were consistent all the way up until the end of the communist regime. When I went there at the very collapsing end of communism, there was nothing to buy. It was just surreal to go into shops with nothing but empty shelves. China, uh, they did not begin their confiscation until relatively late. This was not introduced initially by the communists. They maintained private property for a rather long time. It starts in 1958. Uh, they said the farmers will turn over the land to the collectives. They will own them collectively. So it wasn't quite a state ownership system like it was with factories, but they would collectively own the land. Uh, they created 25,000 of uh, the state communes, 5,000 households each. What did the farmers do? They hid their grain, they consumed as much of it as they could, and they slaughtered their livestock. They responded rationally to the incentives and sold anything they could. A starvation by 1959 had become widespread. And again, reading eyewitness accounts of this, you have to have a very strong stomach uh, to get through this. Again, very good data on the numbers of pigs, not so much on humans. Uh, the numbers uh, collapsed just in Hunan province alone, 10.9 million to 3.4 million uh, pigs as people slaughtered them, saying better to eat them than to lose them. Uh, the total death toll of Frank de Cotter and his uh, massive study uh, based on archives from the party that he was able to get access to, so the internal party leadership was aware of this, uh, about 45 million people in uh, about a three and a half year period. So this is the greatest uh, killing in all of human history measured by numbers. Uh, Cambodia is another interesting case. The Khmer Rouge, uh, Khmer Rouge took over in 1975. Uh, no one knew what they were going to do. Uh, Prince Nordam Sihanouk had said we should welcome them. Uh, he deserves a great deal of blame for what happened because people said, okay, let them come in. And the next day, the next day, they began implementing their radical program. They forced ur urban people out of the cities, uh, forced them into agricultural labor, destroyed the traditional holdings of the Cambodian peasantry, uh, and instituted uh, collective uh, agricultural production. Mass starvation ensued, and the consequence, of course, was further punishments for the farmers. They had to be worked to death to produce food, and the consequence we know very well. This is one of the great uh, horror stories. It's a much smaller number uh, than in China, but as a percentage of the population, one of the highest in the world in terms of the numbers who were uh, killed off between 1.7 million and 2.5 million uh, in that period, uh, 1975 to 1979, until Vietnam invaded and uh, put an end to that. Afghanistan is another interesting case of unintended consequences. Uh, there was a coup in 1973, and Mohammed Daoud, who was the cousin of King Zahir Shah, overthrew him. It was a family quarrel, if you will. He had held uh, positions in the cabinet in previous years. Uh, but he had the support of communist army officers, people who were trained by uh, the Soviet Union and really had breathed in the uh, ideology of Marxism uh, in, in their own training. So he collaborated with them. This was a terrible mistake. Uh, a few years later, they got rid of him and all of his family, all of whom were executed. And at that point, they said, now... We will cancel the debts. We will make friends with the simple peasants by eliminating the debts. 
uh, that they hold to the larger uh, landowners and begin to expropriate the large tracts of land. The consequence on the social fabric was catastrophic and unanticipated by these urban uh, military officers with communist education. The reason was the poor people relied on the credit and advances from the wealthier landowners who employed them. And when that credit was eliminated, no more was forth forthcoming and the social fabric in the villages and in the rural areas simply collapsed. They doubled down on it then and began to attack religion. And this was a terrible mistake for them. Burning the Quran and shutting down mosques. And we know what happened afterwards. Uh, there was a great deal of popular rebellion. The USSR then invaded to save the regime, but it was too late. What had been started could not be undone. And it started with expropriation without compensation. And one thing led to another. No one would have anticipated this chain of events. But that was the beginning of this uh, terrible policy and the country was almost totally destroyed. If you go to Afghanistan, which I go occasionally, uh, it's just heartbreaking to drive past what you know were formerly beautiful buildings and orchards. The country was famous for its fruit production, production of uh, tree nuts and so on. Utter devastation as a consequence of this. Now that may all sound like ancient history. That's 20th century. That couldn't happen now. Well, let's look at a case that is unfolding before our eyes. It's not just recent, it's happening right now, today. This is going on. A Venezuela from 2001 to 2018. In 2001, President Hugo Chavez, who had tried to get into power in a military coup in 1992, he failed, he was jailed uh, as a coup plotter. Uh, then, later, he was released and he ran and was actually legally elected. And then began to rig the system so he and his successors would hold power forever. He issued a decree to confiscate property without compensation. Now he said, of course, our socialism accepts private property, but as he made clear, on our terms. It will be on the terms that we dictate. And he said, this land is not yours, it is the nation's land. All property was put into question. All property claims now were dubious. Well, what was the consequence? People began to kill off their cows and agricultural production starts to fall. Who gets blamed? Not only the farmers, and more confiscations follow, but it turns out the evil fertilizer countries are not in solidarity delivering enough fertilizer to the farmers. That's the problem. So the fertilizer companies are nationalized without compensation. And then it just snowballed. Any firm, any company can be taken over by the colectivos. Chavez and later his successor Maduro would go through neighborhoods and they'd say confiscate, confiscate, confiscate. And armed men would go and kick the family or the owners out. That's the condition in the country today. Uh, this is a grocery store in Venezuela. There is a shortage of everything. Cooking oil, flour, soap, rice. People are hungry. The prices have gone through the roof, which has been helped by the massive inflation. Congratulations. The World Bank estimates it'll reach 1 million percent this month. So it's a great milestone for the Venezuelans. Uh, in 2017, according to a study by three universities in Venezuela using a demographic survey and statistical methods, the average weight loss of the adult Venezuelans was 11 kilos. So in Latin America, they joke about the Venezuelan diet. There's all these other diet fads. This is a new one. Try the Venezuelan diet. You start with socialism, confiscation of land, and you can take off 11 kilos in the space of a year. Uh, but I should point out, it's not true for everyone. This is Nicolas Maduro about a month ago in Istanbul, 
uh, someone took a video on a cell phone of him having a fabulous, amazing dinner of prime rib. Uh, this was circulated on social media and uh, people understood that the poor people are suffering, but Nicolas Maduro and the cronies, they call them the bulligarchs. It's the Bolivarian Revolution, because they falsely claim connections to Simon Bolivar, but the people who benefit are the bulligarchs. Unsurprisingly, the richest person in the country happens to be, by sheer coincidence, the daughter of Hugo Chavez, the man who initiated this. That's the richest person in the entire country. No doubt because she's just a brilliant investor. Uh, <clears throat> that must account for it. Uh, so if we think about the way that this was done also, they used the law systematically to punish their opponents and reward their supporters. There was a petition circulated in the country, three million people signed it, three million adult voters, calling for impeachment or removal of the president by legal means. Another petition of 500,000 opposing that petition. The government kept all that information and created a unified database. And guess what was the basis for the confiscations and the awards of lands after that? That database. And social scientists have gone through and combined the list. They said there's no question that that database was the foundation for it. <clears throat> so that has been the uh, basis of the redistribution, uh, was giving assets to friends and taking it uh, from your critics. Violence has engulfed the country. It's quite awful. You can see images of police shooting people just at point blank uh, during the protests. Uh, and the consequence is a refugee crisis. The UNHCR this month uh, issued their report based on their tabulations, not a, just an estimate or a guesstimate. Over three million Venezuelans have left Venezuela involuntarily. That is 10% of the population. They have, they're streaming into Brazil, into Colombia, uh, into even Guyana and they're traveling across Brazil and Colombia and arriving in the Peruvian and Ecuadorian borders. 20,000 a day are being registered at the Peruvian border as people are streaming out because there's no food, there's no medicine. The country is in a complete free fall. So sometimes bad intentions are less important than unintended consequences. That's what matters. So here are just a couple of very quick lessons that I draw from this. Uh, the huge famines that resulted, none of those were anticipated and none of them were intended. As terrible as those dictators were, they weren't that bad as to systematically do that intentionally. Chains of consequences are set up. One leads to another. The case of expropriation of fertilizer companies in Venezuela being a case in point. This was not the initial intention, but someone had to be found guilty and responsible for that. You don't have to have bad intentions to generate bad consequences. And if anyone thinks, well, this just couldn't happen here, think again, as we heard from uh, our Venezuelan friends. Those were not intended, but they happened. They happened, despite no one having intended those outcomes. Now, the last point I'd like to bring up, and that is about real ideological communist ideologues, the ones who address each other as commissards whom I have met in this country, uh, they have a different understanding of truth and loyalty from other people. And anyone who thinks we can just trust them at their word should think again. Marx has a different understanding of truth. There's bourgeois truth and proletarian truth. Your truth and my truth. This is what they believe. And other people who interact with them should know that. President Daoud found out uh, in Afghanistan uh, what it meant to trust them, because he and his whole family were killed as a consequence. When people begin to consume the capital, when they eat up all the food, when they kill all the livestock, someone has to be found guilty. Wreckers, saboteurs, enemies of the people. It's a natural process, because those who institute the policy cannot say, we did it. It's not possible. They can't say, well, oops, we did, made a mistake. Someone else has to be found guilty, and the process will steamroll as a consequence. Now, this is not a novel idea. We've seen expropriation without compensation all throughout human history. It was the norm for much of human history. 
One of the most important things confiscated is the right to buy and sell land. And that was the experience of one of the most horrific expropriations without compensation. It was in this country with the Native Land Act of 1913. But that was repealed. And I hope that South Africans don't effectively bring it back. So last point. Expropriation without compensation, uh, compensation means the abolition of property. It's not a footnote to the property law. It means there is no property law when you have no legal security whatsoever. And people do not invest in what they think they will not, likely not own tomorrow. And anyone who receives title based on this should be aware it too is subject to being confiscated without appropriation. When the political winds change or they fall out of favor or there's some scapegoat, that is needed to explain the failure. So, my last thought. In this country, there are millions of Zimbabwean refugees. And my question is, if you do the same thing in South Africa, where will you go? Thank you. Yeah. I've used up all my time here.